I wanted to touch upon a couple of things for you today and then open up for Q&A. Uh, first was to uh, just give you a brief uh, overview of what we're uh, seeing and hearing uh, when it comes to North Korea uh, and what's happening in the Korean Peninsula. Obviously with the Pyeongchang Olympics underway, uh, there's a lot of international tension uh, given to what's happening in the Korean Peninsula, which is good. Um, but you know, clearly, uh, a question that is among many of our minds is what happens after the Olympics. <laughs> because this is sort of a temporary truce, and we should not take it for granted. Uh, what will happen immediately following the Olympics, I think, will say a lot about whether um, you know, the countries are serious about pursuing dialogue over a military intervention. I was also asked to speak about you know, your uh, upcoming meetings on the Hill, any kind of practical tips that I can provide, having worked there for six years, so I'm happy to kind of give you some practical you know, uh, advice uh, in terms of how to conduct yourself and, and sort of your general outlook. Um, and then happy to you know, answer any questions you might have about any things I raised. Um, so I think <clears throat> on the situation in the Korean Peninsula and in North Korea in particular, you know, it, it's, I mean, I think, you know, any um, kind of cursory observer of uh, international, you know, affairs understands that we're living in a very serious, uh, serious time. Um, the United States, as you know, has been, uh, you know, um, uh, kind of pursuing this um, policy of maximum pressure and maximum engagement, but uh, up till I would say even this morning, when Vice President Pence, you know, noted, as you know, uh, on Air Force um, One uh, coming back from Korea, that they would be open to dialogue. I personally was not sure that the administration was seriously going to uh, let their diplomats do the hard work of, of resolving um, the impasse uh, between U.S. and North Korea through talks. Um, I, like you, were, uh, was very concerned when I heard about uh, this bloody nose uh, strategy that many of you are nodding your heads and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, that seems like one of the most reckless uh, and dangerous uh, policy ideas um, you know, that I've certainly ever heard um, and particularly in the context of North Korea and given how little we know about Kim Jong-un, uh, it seems particularly dangerous um, and so I would say that you know, as Korean Americans, and, and we have, there's about 1.8 million of us here in the United States, many in California, some in New York, uh, and, and then in places like Atlanta and Houston and Dallas as well. So we're not just in the coastal areas and big cities anymore. We're everywhere. <laughs> and as Korean Americans whose you know heritage and uh, you know really harkens back to the peninsula, um, you know we have mixed feelings, as you can imagine. Um, you know, none of us think that what's happening inside North Korea is good. Uh, none of us think that the people who live, you know, under the dictatorship, uh, you know, should be just ignored. Um, you know, uh, many of us are Christians and, and have strong faiths, um, and we, you know, personally believe that, uh, you know, the situation in which the people of North Korea are living is uh, deplorable. Um, <clears throat> but we also don't want another war in the Korean Peninsula. And as the United States have done with past adversaries, whether it's Vietnam or Myanmar or the Soviet Union, we have to come and talk. We can't go straight to war <laughs> without giving dialogue and uh, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, a chance to succeed. And the fact of the matter is, United States intelligence on North Korea is very poor. We've gotten just about every estimation on what's happening inside North Korea and its uh, mil missile and nuclear technology wrong, again and again and again. So clearly, we don't have good intel on what the heck is going on in there. So for us to kind of jump uh, and say, well, now we will, you know, launch this uh, limited military strike, you know and see what happens, and hopefully North Korea will retreat and learn its lesson about the, you know, the mightiness of the United States military, seems very problematic um, and almost begging for war. Um, so I do think that for all of us uh, who are citizens who are um, following these issues closely, we need to call our government out when they say stuff that don't make a lot of sense. Um, because, you know, we're talking about lies here. Um, I know that, um, you know, in terms of the meetings that you'll have on the Hill, one of the things that, you know, you'll encounter is, well, you know, the North Korean regime is, is, is evil, basically. You know, look what happened to Otto Warmbier, look what it does to its own people. Uh, its human rights abuses are well documented, including at the UN level. So how can you, you know, kind of say, well, let's not go to war with North Korea? And I, I kind of sense that kind of, our argument is, is uh, getting, that chorus is getting somewhat, you know, larger and larger, um, you know, particularly after uh, the way Otto was, uh, was treated and, and, and died. 
Um, and I think it's so, it's so tragic what happened to him. And I, as a mother of a two-year-old, I feel for his parents. And, and I think all of us would understand where his parents are coming from when they say, hey, something has to be done. Uh, but I think we need to challenge the notion that, you know, to deal with North Korea, we need to get our tanks and our Air Force and, and just kind of go in there and just, you know, uh, do an invasion of some kind or, or launch a strike. I mean, all of these things that the military talking heads talk about, you know, on Fox News and so forth, you know, nobody seems to question, well, what happens the day after you do that? You know, who, who's talking about the environmental impact? the health impact of a potential nuclear war. Who's talking about, you know, who's gonna fight this thing, right? It's gonna be our, you know, husbands and, and wives and our neighbors. I mean, nobody explains to you what happens the day after a strike. Everyone thinks that doing a strike is a, is a fantastic idea and we have the military, you know, wherewithal to get it done. But, you know, no one's doing the hard work of, of like I said, having an actual strategy behind it, which again, I think does a disservice to the men and women in uniform and puts all of our lives in danger. So I think we need to call them out on that. Um, <clears throat> in terms of practical tips you know, for your meetings, I think number one, you should just be comfortable. And you know, many of you have done this type of lobbying meetings before. I realize this is a, a, a you know, um, kind of a sophisticated crowd. Um, but I would just say, you know, this is your elected representative. You have nothing to be afraid of. Their staff works for you. Uh, they're, they're getting paid through taxpayer money to be here to represent you. So when you meet with your member of Congress or Senator, just be comfortable. You know, there's no need to be nervous about the whole thing. Um, I think the staff that you'll meet, more likely than not, will probably have glanced at any email that you send, any information you send in advance of the meeting. So just be prepared to remind them of why you're there, as opposed to assuming that they've read everything you share uh, via email. Um, I think it's also true that, <clears throat> particularly in North Korea, you should remind them that there's actually a much bigger coalition. There's Peace Action and then there's like Peace Action Plus, <laughs> like groups like CKA and many others who are doing exactly what you're doing. So CKA is going to be bringing Korean Americans to Washington uh, for our annual summit and gala, but we, we will do exactly what you're doing. Uh, so just remind them that this is not just Peace Action issue, this is, there's a huge constituency that is getting organized. And I think the key word to use is organized because staffers get really afraid <laughs> when they realize that you're not just representing yourself, you're representing like an army of people. Uh, that is, I think, a trigger point for staff and members. So you can't just be like, oh, I'm from you know, Iowa and I just came here to talk about North Korea, I'm really work. You know, you should tell them, like, I'm part of an organization with a national reach that also meets with other national organizations regularly. Uh, and we're all collectively extremely concerned about the, the rhetoric coming out of the White House and frankly the lack of uh, kind of a check by the Congress uh, to make sure that this president does unilaterally take us into another war. Uh, so I think those are some of the kind of general things that I would say about your meeting. I think, you know, reminding them of the human cost of war is really powerful. You should really like make sure the staff like makes eye contact with you and understands the gravity of the issue. Don't like just bypass it, like, well, the environmental impact, you know, men and women in uniform, trillion dollars of, you know, PTSD. Like, don't gloss over it. You know, really take your time with it. <laughs> make them feel the pressure. Because uh, you're there to pressure them, right? You're there to make them act. Uh, so educate them. And if you have any ties to veterans or people, you know, who are uh, in, in uh, the armed services now, mention that. You know, say my brother is a Marine, you know, my sister, you know, uh, is a doctor <coughs> in the Army. So I think inserting those things uh, make it make your story uh, much more likely to be heard. Um, I think, <clears throat> you know, the staffers in Congress, as you know, are wearing many different hats. And it's often really hard, and it's frankly really distracting, <laughs> because um, you get pulled into wherever, you know, whatever issue uh, kind of uh, makes the loudest noise, right? So during appropriation cycle, it's like all about the budget. And the same staffers that are doing the budget may also be working on foreign policy, <coughs> more likely than not, especially in the House. Um, <clears throat> you know, so there, whatever the, the biggest issue is, whether it's health care or whatnot, you know, the Congress will most likely be focusing just on that uh, at the expense of many other things that are going on around the world. And so these types of meetings, whether it's with constituents or powerful groups, is just like your one opportunity to make the case that there are other things that they should be doing. Uh, and I saw that uh, from Paul that you have a couple of uh, specific action items for you know for them to consider, whether it's co-sponsoring the constitutional strike against North Korea bill, 
or opposing uh, preventive war, <coughs> I'm sorry, preventive military force with North Korea, making statements, uh, floor speeches, etc. cetera. Um, I think those are all great, and uh, I think you need to put them there for those staffers to think about. And then you should follow up with them, right? Because they're going to forget. <laughs> you know, things are going to, you know, they're going to be kind of like, you know, lurching onto the next crisis issue, the next issue, and it's really easy to forget uh, as, as much as they probably mean well. Um, so then you got to kind of double down, you know, about a week from now, have one of your, you know, whoever is kind of the leader of your meeting, follow up um, and, and, and ask them if they haven't done anything, why? Uh, and try to get as much answer as possible. I think, um, you know, I, I've interacted with a lot of different groups during my time on the Hill, and you know, some of the more memorable ones um, didn't have like 20 constituents in the room. It was like a mix of constituents and people who really cared about the issue. And there was also a wide range of age. So you had like even like teenagers, <laughs> you know, come uh, all the way to you know elderly or you know veterans or whatever. But it was like a really diverse mix of people. And they were basically all saying the same thing, but from different vantage points. And I found that to be really effective. Uh, because if you have like a monolithic group coming in, you know, it, it's not as interesting, <laughs> I would say, than kind of having, you know, like let them really um, figure out, you know, wow, th this, is, this is an issue that affects a lot of different people, not just one type of people. Um, same thing if a bunch of Korean Americans walk into a room, they'll say, oh, you, you care about this issue because you're Korean American. Well, what if we brought up you know, a bunch of other people who are not Korean American, who are all saying the same thing? You know, Then it really, I think, um, brings home the point that this is about a much bigger community of people who are concerned. So I think showing that sense of organization and unity, uh, especially in the structure, is, is, is really critical. Um, I think, <clears throat> I'm sure you have uh, questions kind of percolating in your mind, so I'll stop here. But um, I, I mean, I think, you know, Congress is in a tough spot. Um, it's uh, not the most functional branch of government, unfortunately, because there's so many issues and, and so many um, challenges facing you know, this country that members of Congress, I think, have, have really limited bandwidth when it comes to foreign policy issues. Uh, I, interact, I, I kind of contended with that firsthand as a, as a you know, foreign policy advisor. Um, one of my bosses, as Paul mentioned, is Jim McDermott, uh, who's no longer in Congress, uh, but represented Seattle and was a ardent um, anti-Iraq, uh, you know, war, um, you know, uh, advocate. Um, and um, you know, I saw Jim kind of, you know, even get attacked um, so many years after <laughs> the Iraq War had started. Uh, people were, you know, calling him back that Jim uh, and, and saying all these things. And I remember seeing, you know, how. Um, how difficult it is for members of Congress to just stand on principle <laughs> because it's so easy to be politically expedient or just ignore altogether. And I think uh, the reason your group is important is you're showing that there's a constituency that cares. And when they do something right, you should also call them so they feel the love. But I think um, it's, it's, it's not that difficult to understand the mindset, I think, of, of most members of Congress. They just want to hear from constituents and they want to stay in office and, and they want to do something good. Uh, it's just you know, they get pulled in so many different uh, different ways that it, it ultimately makes it very difficult. But hopefully on an issue like this, where we're talking about a potential nuclear war, um, you know, the choice is obvious. Uh, yet, as you know from studying these bills, you know, there aren't as many co-sponsors as, as there should be. So clearly we're not doing enough to really say, hey, this is a no-brainer kind of bill, like you need to be on it. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican, um, you need to, you know, take a position on this one because uh, we're talking about real lives here. So uh, let me stop there and uh, answer any questions. I hope that was enough That's uh, to get us started. Okay. Should I yeah, take that? Okay, yeah. Um, so that is, uh, in a nutshell, and if you Google it, like there'll be so many articles yeah. about it because it, it made a big, yeah, it was a big news story um, a couple of uh, weeks ago. But yeah, essentially the idea is that the United States would launch some sort of a limited military strike to give North Korea, like, you know, uh, Anal right. Analogous of a bloody nose, but not necessarily like kill them, you know. Yeah. Uh, so you kind of like do this limited strike in the hopes that North Korea will back down, stop its nuclear development, and all that stuff. Um, but the backlash to that strategy was pretty resounding, you know, in terms of people saying, "What in the, you know, <laughs> like this sounds like we're starting a war," <laughs> because you know North Korea would, you know probably retaliate, and, and that would be part of the risk, right, that we would take by doing that. 
which is a very serious thing to contend and think about. So uh, folks have said that seems, and that in fact was the reason the U.S. Uh, ambassador nominee to South Korea, uh, with you know apparently um, his nomination has been taken off the table, even though the host country has already approved it, which is which makes this a very extraordinary situation where. Um, because of this issue and the fact that Dr. Cha did not agree that this was the right strategy, the White House has said, well, you're, we're not going to send you to Korea then. So, you know, that, that was like part of the reason the story got so much attention because it was directly tied to the nominee for U.S. Ambassador South Korea, which hasn't been filled in over a year. Wow. Okay. Some of the recent coverage is, so if you go to New York Times and type <coughs> Nicholas Kristof, there's actually a video that he made from his latest trip to Pyongyang. And that's worth watching. It's only like six minutes long, but it's got footages of him, you know, talking to North Koreans and trying to understand what what they're thinking. Um, I highly recommend that video, as well as an opinion piece that he wrote uh, after his trip, which gives you a glimpse of what North Koreans are uh, thinking about and how they approach the United States. So I would start there. Um, I think, yeah. So that, I think that's a good place to start. And. Um, if there are other articles, I'd be happy to share with Paul, but that kind of came to mind uh, uh, first because um, very few Westerners get to <coughs> North Korea, uh, as you know, and especially after the State Department's travel restriction, you know, it's kind of difficult altogether for Americans to go into North Korea at this point. Um, but if you're interested in more of a historical perspective, you know, there are, um, uh, let, let me think about that. Um, so, Council of Korean Americans is comprised of about 200 very successful Korean American leaders from across the country. So we have a lot of members in uh, California, East Coast, and uh, Midwest, some in the South, and um, we're growing. So, um, you know, we don't intend to stop here at 200, but we also have a, um, a distribution list of folks who sign up to get our emails, uh, updates. Uh, of around 5,000, and then we have a robust <coughs> social media presence. So these are some of the ways that we kind of disseminate information about what we're up to, and you're welcome to sign it, uh, uh, to join us uh, by going to our website. But in answer to your question about our policy position, you know, we have uh, a very di uh, diverse group of individuals who are members of the organization that we go to for advice, uh, some of whom are former Pentagon officials, the, some are um, heads of major organizations like the Plowshares Fund that also works on this issue uh, quite a bit. Others are like analysts and foreign policy advisors and people like that. So we've gone to them to talk to them about, you know, what should a, a rational, kind of a non because we're a nonpartisan organization, so what is like a, a good position for CTA to advocate that doesn't alienate any kind of political parties, but gets our message across that they need to do more on North Korea? And the, the statement is on our website, but long story short, uh, we believe that as Korean Americans, uh, we have a unique vantage point uh, and, and a personal connection to the Korean Peninsula. And so uh, when it comes to a potential war with North Korea, we feel like it's an obligation to speak up. Um, and uh, we feel that uh, as, a, as, a, as a country, as a strong country, uh, we should uh, pursue dialogue uh, first uh, before you know, uh, launching any kind of you know preventive uh, or preemptive strike against North Korea, and so, and we also believe that there's a humanitarian angle and a human component to North Korea that most Americans miss, because we all kind of just think about the caricature of North Korea as like Kim Jong Un, you know, he's like the only, and then the missiles, you know, you always see the missiles parading down the street. It's Kim Jong Un and the missiles. That's all you ever see. You don't ever see, you know, ordinary. Like, to your point, you know, ordinary Korean Americans. We don't know much about them. Um, it's almost like we don't care. Um, yet, most North Koreans look just like me. You know? And a lot of Korean Americans have family who lived in the North or live in the North now, who we haven't been able to stay in touch or reach over 60 plus years. So you know, I think there's a human dimension and a humanitarian dimension that we're also trying to remind policymakers. Um, but you know, it, it, it's tough. As a nonpartisan kind of nonprofit organization, our main function is to, be, uh, to provide education, you know, and information uh, to, to our audience. And um, on an issue like this, where we need more Republicans, frankly, to step up and say, you know, let's do this. You know, let's get on these bills and let let's stop this, you know, uh, slow kind of moving train wreck. Um, we need to be really mindful of that. And so I'm very, um, you know, uh, personally, you know, focused on how to talk to Republican legislators. 
you know, making them understand that this is a nonpartisan issue that affects all current Americans. Um, yeah, those are um, those are all great questions. So I think you know, on the more intermediate to long term, um, you know, uh, what are some of the things that we should be asking for? Um, you know, I have heard from informed. Um, and very well connected um, uh, foreign policy advisors here in Washington that in some ways President Trump is easier on North Korea than say President Obama because he's more kind of flexible. He's, he's more like, you know, let's just see where things, you know, where is President Obama? Like he said, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna um, negotiate with you know, this regime. And he kind of just stuck with that. Um, so, you know, to President Trump's credit, you know, he's shown more flexibility, which I think is good. Um, <clears throat> what you're, you know, suggesting in terms of like a longer term solution, you know, uh, I think are things that many people should be getting paid to think about <laughs> in government, because it's a really hard question, right? You're saying, you know, we're talking about normalizing relations with a country that we don't have a relationship with, we don't have an embassy here, we don't have diplomatic relations with North Korea. Uh, so we're talking about some sort of a diplomatic breakthrough that would allow us to kind of have that normal relationship as we do with most other countries. Um, and then you're talking about, well, how do we end this Korean War that has only, you know, all these years later been technically still at war, right, with each other, because, and it's just the armistice that's uh, keeping you know, the two countries uh, separated. Um, I think that goes into, yeah, a, you know, a conversation that United States and South Korea and North Korea should have. Um, I will say that, you know, your comment reminds me of um, <clears throat> an important de uh, development right now, which is the talks between North Korea and South Korea, which many people, uh, I think, are seeing as a positive sign. Um, certainly, those two countries need to work their differences out, because believe me, most South Koreans have very strong feelings about North Korea. I mean, South Koreans have been killed, abducted, like this is not a country where they're like, all right, you know, everything's back to normal. We're all like, you know, family. Like, it's not gonna be that easy. So I think just even the fact that the two Koreas are gonna be meeting, you know, over an inter-Korea summit soon is a very positive sign. But as you read from the news, you know, as you know, they're very cautious. Because they're not sure how the United States is gonna react to all of this, right? And so one of the things that we should be urging United States, you know, elected officials is to support, you know, this development. Don't undermine it or undercut it. You know, by saying, well, North Korea is still the same, you know, we only have all these issues. No, like, say it's a good thing <laughs> that these two countries are talking, uh, because I think that will give South Koreans, our ally, a major confidence boost to really get do a good job, you know, and, and see some success. Otherwise, it's, it's a really difficult, you know, balancing act for the South Korean, you know, president to, on one hand, pursue this inter-Korea talk, but then on the other hand, tell the United States, oh, don't worry, we're not gonna like do it for real. Like, it's just like, you know, a show. Like, that would not work, you know? <laughs> you gotta do it, um, and you gotta do it well. So um, so I think, you know, those are some of the dynamics that I see going forward in terms of a longer term solution. Uh, but, you know, we're just kind of like way at the beginning, I think, in terms of any kind of long term progress because there's so many uncertainties right now. Um, I think, you know, in terms of your point about sovereignty, that's absolutely right. Uh, frankly, you should all check uh, your members of, if your members of Congress are on the Congressional Korea Caucus. It's a caucus made up of about 80 House members and 20 senators, and um, <clears throat> they're part of this caucus to, uh, you know, in, in support of the U.S.-South Korea alliance. You know, they're generally members who represent a lot of Korean Americans in their districts, or have like Samsung or Kia, you know, as part of their. Uh, you know, constituency and so forth. So those members in particular <laughs> should really, you know, focus on this issue of sovereignty and how we are treating our ally, you know, South Korea, and how we talk about, you know, our ally. Uh, and you seem to know, you know, exactly the type of, you know, uh, frankly, disturbing rhetoric, you know, uh, coming out of Washington about uh, about that that I don't need to go into. So. You know, I think there we need to hold these lawmakers who say that you know they support the alliance to support the alliance. You know, when it matters, uh, not just like be on a caucus, you know, for fun. Like, this is a serious time uh, that that has uh, unfortunately caused some strains, you know, in the relationship uh, between U.S. and South Korea. So they should be stepping up, you know, and, and we should be asking them to do that. If they're uh, not doing so.
So with the North Korea crisis, you can only imagine how busy Jessica is, and that she was willing to come and share her insights and her expertise with us. So please give her a big round of applause.